Gunjan Bagla is the founder and managing director of Amrit Incorporated, a California consultancy with numerous prominent clients in the medical device and medical supplies business. His articles have been featured on the Harvard, Harvard Business Review blog, and he has appeared on BBC TV, National Public Radio, The New York Times, and The Financial Times as the India expert. This year, Gunjan was a speaker at both MD&M West in Anaheim and MD&M East in Philadelphia. He was featured at India's largest medical device conference in January and was featured on the cover of India's Medical Plastics magazine. On September 14th, Gunjan moderates the medical device panel at the Disruptive Innovation Conference in Beverly Hills, and on September 26th, he is on the keynote panel at MedDevice San Diego. Do email us at USA at Amrit.com if you wish to attend either one of these events. Without further ado, here's Gunjan Bagla. Thank you, Supriya, and welcome to you all. We have people from three continents and about 16 American states joining this event, and thank you so much for being here. We are going to go at a fairly quick pace, and I do encourage you to send me questions as they come to your mind. Uh, because this, we want to make this experience as interactive as possible. So earlier this year, the uh, Chicago Public Transport System, the Metra, which is one of the systems there, announced that they were going to purchase about a million dollars of, uh, uh, of these uh, defibrillators from uh, Cardiac Sciences Corporation. Uh, it's about 400 of the power hard G3 devices. And, you know, normally that wouldn't be a big piece of news in the medical device business, but for those of you attending this particular webinar, it's, it can be significant because some of you might know that a couple of years ago, Cardiac Sciences was actually purchased by an India company called OptoCircuits. They paid over $64 million and have since gone on to expand the cardiac sciences business worldwide. Uh, more and more of this kind of activity is happening. And so India is showing up in the medical device business in ways that you might not expect. Let me give you another example. Uh, here in, uh, in California, one of, the, one of the most famous events that is held is called the TED Conference. Uh, that used to stand for technology, entertainment, and digital, but now it's really about breakthrough ideas coming from all over the world, and it is attended by movers and shakers uh, from uh, the US, Europe, and uh, really everywhere. One of the presentations at this conference by, was by a young entrepreneur who talked about creating a device pictured here called the Touch B. Uh, the Touch B Quick, I think, is the name of the production device. And this, uh, this device is, is uh, designed to be able to measure uh, the presence or absence of anemia, particularly in pregnant women and particularly in poor countries across the world where many pregnant mothers and their babies die uh, as a result of, uh, of being anemic, a problem that would be easily corrected, easily corrected if, uh, uh, if uh, iron pills were available to them. Uh, and iron pills don't cost much, so it's really a matter of diagnosing the, uh, the condition in time. This device also measures pulse rate and oxygen, much like a pulse oximeter, but instead of costing you know, tens of thousands of dollars and uh, being a, a, you know, a, a benchtop uh, device, this is really handheld and it runs on a couple of AA batteries. You can train an unskilled worker to use it in a few minutes. Now what's remarkable is that the inventor of this device is a young Indian entrepreneur, Dr. Mishkin Ingawale, uh, and his company is called Biosense, based in Mumbai. If you want information about this, this particular product or about the TED Talk, uh, send us an email at usa at and uh, we, will, uh, we will send you the links that you can, uh, you can uh, find out more about it. But let me jump into the bulk of the talk right now. And here's the agenda that we'll be covering. We'll talk a little bit about selling Western products, whether American or European, into India. We will talk a little bit about regulations around medical devices in India, such as they are. We'll talk about using talent in, in, from India for uh, 
your products and services offered worldwide and perhaps for Western markets in particular. And then we'll briefly look at the idea of using India surprisingly as a manufacturing base. Now, many of you are thinking about these types of questions relating to another large Asian country. And I, I would imagine that many of you are already present in that country, China. And so it's important for you to keep in mind the different ways in which India and China function. And I'll try and allude to that just a little bit as we go along. But let me do one thing first. Let me find out a little bit more about the audience. And for that, we have a series of short interactive polls. And I'm going to run the first one. You should see on your screen a question. I see it. Uh, the majority of you are interested in India, and that's perhaps the bias of the attendees for this webinar, given that that was the topic. But I see a fair number of you are interested in Brazil and China and in Southeast Asia. I'm surprised that none of you are interested in Africa, and that may just be a factor of the, the, the type of people who are attending this webinar. In our larger surveys across our prospect and client base, we find that Africa figures a little more highly than this. But let me close the poll and move on. So let's talk a little bit about selling into India and let's look at the broader question for one, which, which we addressed in some of our uh, pre-webinar materials. This is really about going beyond the first, the billion richest people in the world, which largely populate North America, Europe, Japan, and Australia, and looking at the next three billion medical consumers. And they are in many ways substantially different from the richest billion. The picture at the bottom is one of the busy streets in, in it could be really any Indian city. I think this happens to be the city of Lucknow in North India, and you'll see how packed it is. But what's important to keep in mind is that in, in emerging countries, people have smaller wallets. This is not just the patients, but also the physicians and medical providers who care for them, as well as the hospitals who administer these services. In many of these markets, insurance is not as significant a factor. And so the patient and the patient's family are often paying for a big chunk of the cost of the medical device and treatment. What people often forget to consider when they are taking a Western product into, into a market such as India, is that the cost of labor in a country like India or, or, or in a region like Africa or even China is very significantly lower. And this has an impact on the way you staff your, uh, the function that delivers work out of the medical device, how many people you can deploy to operate, maintain, repair, and rebuild those devices. And this has a big, big impact on the way that you market your product. Also, at least in India today, medical malpractice and the lawsuits and expenses associated with it are not a significant factor for the planning of, of, uh, of your uh, expenses as well as of your, uh, uh, of your uh, uh, marketing and sales and service. So there, I would say that there's a significantly lower risk. As we look at companies that have entered the markets such as India, we find that a few of them are in the stage of doing some ground up redesign for products. And we find that in many cases, this can produce a huge multiple uh, on, on your sales. We may get into that a little bit later on, but that's just something to keep in mind. So if you look at India in particular, it's, it's a market that's, it's an economy that's approaching about $2 trillion soon, growing fairly rapidly. But more important, the healthcare segment is growing at 12 to 15% per year. There are no reliable estimates of the size of the medical device market, but our estimates uh, lead us to believe that this year in 2013, the market may be about $4.2 billion. The interesting thing is that revenue-wise, foreign companies and American companies in particular are very significant, and they have about two-thirds of the market share uh, in India. As I mentioned earlier, most of this is being paid either out of pocket or by uh, government entities if, if you're serving uh, the uh, government hospitals such as those run by the military, the Indian railways, or the state governments. 
private insurance, the kind that we are used to in this country, is still a fairly small segment, but growing extremely rapidly. Uh, as you see here, it was less than 1% of the population was covered by this in 2009. And we think that the numbers this year may be in the na neighborhood of 6 or 7%. Because India's economy is growing, the government has more money to spend on health care. And they are planning to double the expenditure to about 2 2.5% of GDP over time. Much of this is going to support the National Rural Health Mission, but some of it is also going to provide services within the urban areas. And, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, so there is widespread spending that is anticipated. Now, keep in mind that most of the buying that the Indian government does, whether it's the federal government agencies or the provincial state government agencies, are via what they call tenders. And most of the time, the only way that you can win a tender is to be the L1 or lowest cost bidder. And so these are bitterly contested over price. The way that foreign companies can generally win these tenders is to have sufficient educational information distributed that some of their advantages and benefits are reflected in the tender. If the specs are, are very loose, if the specs are minimal, then almost always a local company will be able to produce the product at a much lower cost than a Western company uh, and will invariably win the bid. But if you plan correctly and you invest the marketing effort, uh, you can and you will win business through these L1 tenders. Watch out, however particularly as an American company, and this is where U.S. companies have to be much more careful uh, than, 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 than others because of the requirements of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. It is known that there are some European companies that are a little more loose with, with, with some of these concerns, and uh, therefore we've heard from some of our American clients that they often lose business not only to Indian companies, but also to, to some European players. But we think overall, in the long run, it is a fairly level playing field if you are able to invest the effort uh, uh, and, and in education and in uh, training the uh, opinion leaders. So I'd like to show, demonstrate what we are doing through pictures. And on the top left is a hospital that I visited with one of our major European clients. It's the, uh, the flagship Apollo Hospital uh, in Chennai, India, in South India. And uh, the Apollo chain was started by Dr. Reddy, who was a practicing physician in the United States. And uh, he's of Indian origin and decided to move back to India and uh, set up a for-profit hospital chain. It has done extremely well. In fact, its, uh, it's uh, medical practices have been featured in case studies at the Mayo Clinic and uh, at the Harvard Business School. The Apollo hospitals, however, represent the upper end of the uh, of the healthcare chain. More typical is what you might find at the bottom right. That's a general hospital in the same city in southern India, and uh, as you can see, it you know it is uh, it is what they, in India they call a general ward with lots of beds laid out, and I think this happens to be a maternity ward. And you can see that uh, perhaps it doesn't quite look the same as you might expect in a Western hospital. The little picture on the left, this one here. Is, is actually a more modern hospital than the one you see on the right, but you see how, how many people are crowding the waiting room. This is your typical experience at any mid-sized to large hospital in, in any urban area in India. So you have to keep that in mind that this is a very, very different kind of uh, uh, marketplace when you visit the country. When I was growing up in India, the, uh, the norm for hospital was something like this that you see on the top left. This is a picture of the Mac Robert Hospital in the city of Kanpur, where I grew up. Uh, it's a single-story bungalow that was converted to a hospital, if you will. And the name Mac Robert, as you can imagine, implies some, some of the British heritage. Many of the hospitals in India were built by the British during the 200 years that they ruled the country. Many of them were nonprofits and charities. And so they had names like St. Catherine's or St. Stephen's. And, uh, and th this is really where the best medical care in India used to be delivered in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And things began to change uh, since the liberalization of India began in the early 90s. And today, 
profit is not a dirty word in the Indian healthcare business. And so you start to see many of the more modern types of hospitals. I'll get into that in a minute. Let me also point out the picture at the bottom right. And this is a specialty clinic. It's called the Honda Stone Clinic. Uh, so they probably operate on kidney stones. Uh, there are uh, hundreds of these types of uh, uh, specialized facilities across India, and some of them are located in residential neighborhoods. If you are distributing product in India, you will find that distributors in India are typically focused on the physical movement of goods and perhaps a movement of your accounts receivable. The job of generating primary demand rests really with the foreign OEM. And in India, you may have hundreds of distributors rather than just one or two. Let me run one more poll here. It seems that out of the audience, most people are using a hybrid approach. But uh, the, the next plurality of people are selling direct via their own staff and website. And this might again reflect the fact that some of our attendees are companies that are already present in India in a big way. Many times uh, people will start with national or regional distributors, uh, which is the other categories that you see that some of the people are uh, participating in. Let me hide the poll and so if you look at the market in India, there's about a hundred or so hospitals that look similar to the Apollo that I showed the photo of in the last slide. There's a chain called Fortis. Then there are some others that have started up. The Asian Heart Institute, which started in Mumbai. Uh, the Narayan Hurdale, which claims to do the largest number of uh, uh, bypass surgeries in the world today. The Narayan Hurdale is based in Bangalore, and now they have branches elsewhere, including perhaps soon one in the Caribbean. There are about 500 medium-sized legacy hospitals that are either similar to this uh, McRobert Hospital that I showed here, or are run by the government medical colleges and so on. What is unique about India is these so-called nursing homes, and the term nursing home is very different in, Indi in India than in the West. The nursing home is really a small, small hospital owned by one or two doctors, and it offers uh, specialized services such as the Honda Stone Clinic that you see on the right. We've got some other categories listed here. I won't dwell on them. Let's move on to the next slide. And we will now talk a little bit about regulations in India. Um, those of you who are already in India know that India doesn't really have a, a medical device regulation authority. Devices are currently regulated as drugs. And this function resides under the Central Drugs and Standards Control Organization, which is a federal agency. 95% of its effort is around pharma. Uh, and so in one way, there's very few limitations on what a foreign company can import or sell. If you're already approved by the US FDA, or you have a CE stamp from Europe, you can generally sell the product in India without much trouble. Some states, such as Maharashtra and Gujarat and others, actually have their own FDA, and they may have some other uh, regulations in place. Most device companies, and particularly foreign companies, have felt that the regime is not uh, sufficient to, to uh, provide a stable marketplace. And many Indian companies agree, and device, uh, uh, device regulations have been discussed for the last six or seven years. India being a democracy and a pluralistic democracy, there's many, many ministries involved. The three key ones are the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, the Department of Electronics, and then the Ministry of Chemicals and Fertilizers, which gets involved in some of the policy issues. Now, the good news is that in uh, June of this year, the government announced 
that they would soon be introducing a fresh bill in parliament and uh, this should be fairly mainstream and non-controversial so we expect that the bill may pass this year or next and once the law comes into place the government officials have to write the regulation we don't think that that will happen until as uh, as, as far out as 2015 india general elections due next year and so that's going to distract some of this process but by 2015 or so you should have a fairly well defined regime similar to uh, the us or european regimes and perhaps not not too distant from what china has okay let's move on to talking about the technology side of it but before i do that let me run one more poll okay so we asked about what kind of global engineering you might be considering and for about half of you design and engineering happens only in in the uh, corporate uh, headquarters or uh, within the us or europe about a third of you have captive uh, offshore uh, services either through your own company or through external providers and then a number of you a surprising number of you are partnering with offshore researchers and so on and that's that, that's unusual compared to our prior experience and again it may reflect the composition of this particular audience but it looks like we have a healthy mix and uh, that's that's great so this this helps me calibrate the, the time i spend on various slides but before we do that let me try and address some of the questions that came up because they seem to be relevant to the uh, issues Hi. here i'm back on gunjan sir thanks okay so there are questions about the device regulations will this device regulation introduced to indian parliament include unique device identification guidelines and i think this question has come in from albert uh, albert one thing we have learned about indian government regulations is to not try and second guess them until they have become a little more real so many pro many different options have been discussed since 2005 until now at one time it looked like the indian system was going to be very very similar to the european system and then there was a change of regime and they started bringing in many elements that um, that match the us fda requirements so there is there's a number of moving parts that are coming together the policy issues will be listed in the bill that parliament will pass but the actual nitty gritty about the regulations including device identification and so on i think will is more likely to be addressed at the regulation level and so it i think it would be not prudent for us to try and pre predict which of the various proposals before the committees will actually make it into the regulation sorry i wish i had a better answer than than that for you but we have uh, seen enough of this happen in india that uh, that we we need to be conservative about our projection all righty so let's move on and talk about technology here so there are many many ways in which technical skills in india are helping western companies one one great example is from the uh, jack welch uh, r and d center in bangalore which developed this uh, lullaby baby uh, warmer featured on the left side the device was designed in india for the indian market but it has found a, a ready and willing market in many european countries as well and g uh, g managers have been quoted uh, about selling this fairly successfully into europe i don't believe it is offered in the united states at this time so the captive centers for large companies such as ge siemens siemens uh, philips and and covidian are are reasonably well known there have been news releases about them there have been articles about them but what isn't talked about as much is the work being done by external engineering service providers some of these are large companies that do primarily it services and are now offering engineering services 
to many industries, including medical devices. But we also find very good, uh, competent players who are more specialized and who are niche operators that focus only on engineering services and are perhaps more attentive to the medical device business. So it depends on the specific situation, uh, either a captive center or an external engineering service provider may be the right solution. Now, the pharma business has been running clinical trials in India for, for uh, over a decade, and we are finding that some medical device players are uh, also getting active in running clinical trials for their products uh, within India. So in, 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 in the cases that I have described on this slide, the intellectual property generated, whether it is by the GE, Siemens, Philips uh, types of entities or by the external engineering service providers, it's contracted back to the Western owner. So, uh, you know, a, a, a company such as GE or Siemens would end up owning the, all of the IP developed, whether it's in-house or external. So let's just dwell into these possibilities a little bit deeper. So a, a captive R&D center or a captive engineering center is typically an offshore location staffed by employees that wear your company's badge. It's typically a subsidiary set up within, within that country, such as India, China, or wherever. And this can include a blend of local hires, which will typically form the large majority of, uh, of employees, but there may be some key experts either in leadership positions or in some very specialized uh, functional positions where it makes sense for the expat to be shipped out of Europe, uh, uh, the United States, or the, their other home country and relocated for a, either a period of time or sometimes an extended period within India. I've known of people who've spent a decade and a half in India in, in one of these kinds of roles. So we see very many of these captive engineering centers. The medical device business has been a late comer to this, but if you look at the software industry, you look at, uh, at financial services and others, uh, there's a tremendous number of people working at such captive centers. Another situation which makes sense sometimes is to create a joint venture and you, you have an investment with a local company and put together uh, a corporation that then uh, either markets the product after developing it or just has a contract for development. So an equity investment is involved. We talked a little bit about the outsource partners earlier, so I won't dwell on that. One of the other models that we have found very successful is a collaboration where uh, uh, there may not be a contractual arrangement or a fee for service, but there is a project that the companies work on that is of mutual benefit to, to both the Indian company as well as the Western company. Uh, sometimes this falls under the umbrella of what is referred to as technology scouting. Sometimes it's an IP license. There's many, many different ways to set up mutually beneficial collab collaborations. And uh, that's something that we can explore in detail with any of you if you, if you want to find out more about that. The uh, final arrangement that I want to address a little bit is very common in the United States uh, and to some extent in Europe where you turn to your supplier and say, hey, I'm buying all of this product or ingredient or materials or subsystems from you. I need your help in making whatever I'm buying from you better or I need you to send me, sell me something else and do some of your own R&D and provide the, the final product to me. And the IP rights may, may, may be negotiated as to who owns them, maybe the uh, the customer gets you know one or two years of uh, of uh, exclusive access before the supplier can offer the same kind of technology to others. So historically, this was done within a country's borders, but today there are players within India and other countries that will offer that kind of service to uh, American and European companies as well. And so one of the things we get hired to do often is to evaluate the pros and cons of all of these different alternatives. And the next couple of slides will dwell on on this particular subject a little bit a little bit further. So if you look at your product development cycle, in this particular case, I've divided it on the right here uh, through through some of these phases. And of course, your your classification may vary a little, but typically there's an investigation. Then then you have some kind of concept generation. Then you get into the detailed design and development, and finally you have 
the test verification and in, in, in the, probably, of course, the regulatory uh, phases at, at this point as well. And so what we want you to think about is multiple product or project initiatives, A, B, C, D, and E. And you may find that a different mix of offshoring or outsourcing is appropriate for each project or product initiative. Often companies don't think in this manner, and we found that it's quite valuable to look at each initiative and determine whether it makes sense to outsource that or offshore the test and verification, which is usually the easiest, but you see that there are projects where it makes sense to even do the concept design and investigation offshore. We are currently helping one of our clients manage a project where the market is Latin America. The, the program managers sit in the United States, but all of the work from the investigation all the way to the test and verification is largely being done out of India in this particular case by an offshore engineering service provider who will never actually visit Latin America in the process. So we have to have some very, very tight processes and some excellent communication to make this happen. But it is absolutely possible. It's happening in big ways and it's giving many of our clients tremendous competitive advantage by looking at their product development in this manner. I've got a couple of examples. We can't mention the name of the, the, the companies in this case, but here is an example of a client who set up a captive R&D center. Their initial goal was really cost arbitrage. They found engineers in India cost less than, than those elsewhere, but they also wanted to establish some kind of a brand presence uh, within, within the Asian markets. And one of the big pressures on, on them from their sales and marketing team was to get product out to market much faster and to get more products out to market than their current uh, engineering resources within, within the West were allowing them to do this. They were already considering locating some of these additional resources in Japan when they came to us, and then they had added China and India into the mix, and that's when we came to evaluate it. Within India, we looked at three primary cities in their particular case, because that's what made sense for them. And our approach for that particular client was not to locate any core design in, in, in an offshore market. It was really all about the uh, auxiliary components of design. And the idea was that sustaining engineering, the refreshing of older products, less legacy products, could be done you know, at, their, at their captive India center. In order to build up the capacity of the Captive India Center, they found that it was beneficial to have some short-term contracts with third-party outsourcers uh, just to kind of get the ball rolling. So they, they, they did that to start with, and then the bulk of the work is being done at their Captive R&D Center uh, located in India. They've started to do a little bit more outsourcing now of work that they're not even imagined sending offshore. But now that they have a presence, they have the confidence, their managers uh, are, are beginning to be, get comfortable with this, but they don't feel like they can staff all of those functions inside their captive center. So some of the, some of the other initiatives that would never really have been attempted in the first place are now being del delivered via outsourcers located largely in India. And some of those outsourcers are also sending people to work on site at the client locations. Uh, both in the U.S. and Europe. Here, here's another one of our examples. And in this particular case, cost wasn't really the driving factor. It was, they were concerned about competitive advantage, about getting product to market as quickly as possible because they had fallen behind uh, their key competition. They'd had a failed acquisition of sorts and Wall Street had penalized them for some of the some of their uh, failings in the past. And so they said, let's see if we can uh, spike up the product development process and get something to market more quickly. And so their team in, in India worked very much as an extension of the US team, where they, they had literally morning and evening meetings because this is a West Coast company. They had morning and evening meetings with, with the India team to be able to couple their working. And it, it started out with some work being outsourced with the right to buy out those employees and make them in-house staff over a period of time. And so the client is now running largely an, 
and 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 uh, and uh, a hybrid type of approach, but the core functions that they were really concerned about are being handled in house as an extension of the U.S. product development team. Each company's path is different, so I wouldn't say that I would prescribe an approach to you in advance. You really have to look at your particular needs, the willingness of your management, the gaps in your product development process, and then you can determine the best way to structure your global engineering. One way to visualize this uh, for, for upper management is to look at the medical device R&D center on two axes. The investment that the company makes in time and cost is shown here on the x-axis, and the ability to harness the local innovation is shown on the y-axis. So if you have an agreement with an outside provider at the bottom left, you see that you, you spend very little money doing this, but you're not really getting the full advantage of the leverage of innovation. At the other extreme, the gray arrow on the top uh, shows where you have your own R&D center, and you this takes a lot more time and effort, but you get a much bigger bang for the buck. We find that by placing people in the middle with some other hybrid kind of models, we can give them a benefit of each of the, the extremes and give them a lower risk path to success. So that's something that uh, that often makes sense, but not always. Over the years, we at Amrit have developed what we call our progressive R&D leverage model, the PRNDL model. And I won't dwell uh, much on this. Uh, this is something we presented in white papers and, and conferences elsewhere. But the idea is that most companies go through a phased approach from a type one company, which is simply being driven by cost arbitrage all the way to a type four kind of situation where you are transforming every aspect of your value chain in, in order to benefit from global resources. Most companies, I would say, would fall at, at a two or three kind of phase, and sometimes a, one business unit may be at level one and another business unit may be at level three. We are not saying that level four is better than level one or two or three. We are simply saying that you need to decide what is right for each particular business unit and each product initiative but be aware that this is a spectrum. And some companies that are extremely tight-knit and very forward-looking have been able to get to the type four fairly effectively. But for many other companies, that's not what you should be aiming for. If you can get to type two or three, typically you're doing very well. And these, these slides will be available by email. Uh, so if, you, if you're interested in looking at these in more detail, just uh, drop us an email at the end of this uh, webinar. Now let's look at the next uh, next texture of this. We talked about the three other models earlier where the IP was being owned by the Western company. Here I'm talking about situations where the IP or the patents are being owned by the local Indian companies. Much of this historically has been driven through the Indian pension for software and algorithms it, it used to apply in IT, but more and more medical devices have to have software and, and algorithmic intelligence built into them. So you see that if you want to integrate your device with the with your clients or customers' ERP system, if you want to have applications on mobile or handheld devices, or you want to embed some intelligence in assembly language onto your devices, you may find that there are companies or individuals in India that can offer you uh, some, some tremendous advantage. Another factor that we find is worth hooking onto is India's ability at what, what we call frugal innovation. This has largely been driven by the needs of low cost, low resource economies. And this has generated models where people are sharing glucometers, for example, where you are paying per use for a medical device rather than uh, paying up front, where certain functions are being run 24-7 rather than 40 hours a week, as might be more typical at an American hospital. Uh, when we take clients to India, they're often impressed by how Indian doctors have embraced telecommunication far more vigorously over the years. Part of this is 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 the ability for 
you know, is, is, is driven by the need for frugal innovation. Part of it is simply that India didn't have enough landlines. India today, I think, has about 40 million landlines and 900 million cell phones. So wireless telephony and uh, and 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 Wi-Fi, inter Wi-Fi internet, and other methods of communication really leapfrogged over the personal computer boom uh, within India, and so people are very comfortable using mobile devices, using uh, telediagnosis, if you will, uh, using ways that urban doctors can serve rural populations, because that's a big challenge in a country like India, where the 80, 70 percent of the population, 65 percent of the population, still lives in the in the rural areas, but very few of the doctors are willing to live and work there. And so uh, telecommunications has offered the bridge where much of the initial work can be performed by a by somebody who's not a physician, and then you do some kind of triage and only the, the, the patients that need to come to the city or to a town for medical treatment actually do so. So there, there's many, many... Uh, ways in which India is serving as a laboratory for innovation. And if your company is uh, is uh, interested in taking advantage of that, uh, that's something that is worth looking at. So let's talk about the final topic now relating to manufacturing in India. Now, of course, most of us think of China when we think of offshore manufacturing. And by no means is India going to be a competitive threat to the volume of Chinese manufacturing. But for medical device companies in particular, many of them have concerns about being becoming over-dependent on Chinese manufacturing. Some are concerned about the aspects relating to intellectual property and its violation. Some are concerned about the security of information flowing back and forth and about the risk of their systems being hacked. More recently, the concerns have revolved around the changing situation in China with the economics, costs in Western China, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and, 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 and all the coastal cities have been rising disproportionately. And so many companies are faced with the choice of either moving manufacturing further and further, further and further uh, inland into China or uh, paying higher prices. And uh, as you move further inland, some of those cities aren't quite as easy to get to. Uh, the resources aren't quite similar. And so there's a, there's a re-evaluation of whether this makes sense. The Chinese currency has also been rising slowly but steadily. And that's been a concern that when people look at five and 10 years ahead, they say we need to hedge our bets. And as people start to look at that, India seems to make sense for many slices of the manufacturing pie. If your product or component is high ticket and if the volumes aren't enormous, then I think you, you're well advised to take a look at what India has to offer. If your product could benefit from highly skilled workers, people with college degrees on the, on the, uh, on the machine shop, for example, then it makes sense to look at India as a manufacturing resource. Some of our clients are unwilling to locate key component manufacturing in China for whatever reason, where they want to have control over the IP. And so they say, well, we'll, we'll put some of the high volume, low tech stuff in China, but some of the core manufacturing, we are going to take it out of the US, we will take it to Ireland or, 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 or the right European country, or we might consider locating it in a country such as India. So this is, uh, this is still a new trend, I would say. But many of our clients are well advanced in looking at expanding their supply chain from India. Sometimes it's coupled to the earlier uh, initiatives that I talked about relating to selling within, within India and the region. Sometimes it's tied to an R&D and engineering initiative where you want to have some prototype in low volume manufacturing located close to your uh, technical and engineering resources. But sometimes it's just driven by pure economics. And we think that if you look five or 10 years out in the future, this will be a significant trend and a significant component of the uh, global manufacturing ecosystem for medical devices. Alrighty, let's see if we have any more questions. Uh, Supriya, are you able to see the questions now?
just a moment. I think Supriya is having trouble. So. Hi, Gundan. Yes. Yes, hi. Um, we have a question from Lauren. Um, who writes, uh, we are new to the Indian market. Should we be looking at market entry first or engineering in India first or both at the same time? Uh, Lauren, I think that's that's a dilemma that many companies face when when looking at India for the first time. The short answer is that it depends. But a, most, for most companies, the Indian market is a compelling place to be given the fact that the middle class is growing, that government spending is growing, and that uh, the number of more modern hospitals is growing. So you can't ignore the market. The second uh, component relating to engineering development, I think is also very well worth looking at if you are finding that you are resource constrained. If you have all the resource in the world and you are you are not constrained by your R&D team, then it's something that can probably wait. I would say a company like Apple Computer has felt that they can charge super premium prices for their product and they don't need to globalize their engineering. So Apple proudly says, we do all of our design in California and they actually have a, a television campaign around that. And as long as they are able to maintain that, that market position, it, it makes sense for them. But for most companies, I think it makes sense to look at at uh, uh, some degree of engineering involvement from a country such as India. For some people, China is a more sensible place to do that engineering work. And this is, again, something that can be evaluated very closely uh, based on you know, how much market you have in China and the nature of your product and so on. I hope that answers the question. This is something I could talk on for, about for hours. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and we have another Excellent. question. Um, are there a lot of VC firms interested in investing in U.S. startups with an Indian presence? That's a great question. In fact, we almost added a few slides on, on the VC ecosystem in India uh, for, for India-related startups. Many American venture capital firms have set up offices in India. It started around IT and telecommunications but some of them are now investing in the medical device arena. Some of those investments are directed towards companies that are addressing the Indian market, but more and more, there is activity around companies being built in India that are going to address either a global market or a Western market. And perhaps at a future webinar, we will devote a more significant amount of time to talking about those types of companies. There is another thread that you should keep in mind as well, because this is impacting the medical device business. We talked about venture investing, and that generally means venture capitalists were investing in expectation of a very high uh, return on investment on, and, and a profit on their, on their activity. In addition to that, there is another trend typically driven by the likes of uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, and uh, the founder of eBay, Pierre Omdiar, has, a, has the Omdiar, uh, uh, Omdiar network that is also driving this effort. All three of them have invested significantly both in nonprofit organizations in India that are producing radically different medical devices and treatments, as well as in for-profit entities that are doing this and then building an ecosystem with nonprofits that can deliver the results of their inventions uh, across the Indian, African, and Latin American landscape. So yes, uh, I, we, we did not address, we did not do justice to this particular topic in today's webinar, but we'd be happy to talk more about it in the future. Uh, Gunjan, we have a couple of other questions. I uh, don't know if you want to take them now, or do you want to continue with your presentation? Please, please go ahead. We still, yeah. Okay. We, we are right um, about at the end of the presentation. Let me just switch to the last slide. Okay. okay. Yeah, but go ahead. All right, so Hema is asking, uh, can you give us an idea as to how many companies are manufacturing for the U.S. European market versus for the Indian market? Uh, that's something that we don't really have primary data on. We know what our clients are doing, and our clients are addressing manufacturing in India primarily for Western markets today. But uh, we wouldn't say that that's that's a, uh, that is. A, uh, generalizable to others. Many companies have been in India for decades, 
uh, some of the companies I mentioned earlier, such as Siemens and Philips, have had a strong presence in, in India for decades, and they're doing considerable manufacturing in India for India. But we don't have, really have a good measure of that in, in, in the data points that we have gathered. Okay, and then we have Suranjan, who's asking, what is the current clinical trial environment for medical devices in India? How are current policy, media, and legal discussions going to impact this going forward? Yeah, as you can imagine, any any work where a first world country is conducting clinical trials on third world subjects is is an area that is rife with uh, with risk. Uh, if if there is any misstep by the Western company or by the entities managing the clinical trials. So we recently completed a whole set of work for one of our clients relating to, uh, to, to clinical trials in India. I have to be very circumspect about what I say uh, because the product has, is not going to be released for another couple of years. But we have to be extremely careful about both the shipment of product and organisms into India, about the way that the subjects are informed so that they give informed consent and uh, the the sensitivity to the way that the government reacts to these kinds of activities. So you have to be very proactive and transparent and you have to be cognizant of, of the rules in India as well as of the reaction or a potential adverse reaction that might happen in the media. Uh, the best way to do that in, a, in an open, transparent society such as India is to engage all parties and be sure that nobody feels that they are being backstabbed or surprised. So as long as you maintain the open channels of communication, it is possible to do this. Now, medical device companies have had a little slower going than I would say pharma companies have in being able to run these, uh, these uh, clinical trials but we expect that activity to build up over time. Okay, Are there any great. other questions? Um, we have a I'd like to encourage everybody. This is sort of your chance. If you want to have any other questions, please send it to us. As you see, we're going through it um, pretty quickly before we end the webinar. Um, we have a question from Danielle who asks, are there examples of radical redesign that you can share? Yeah, uh, radical redesign. Uh, the, some of our clients have done this, which I cannot share, but I'll give you an example from from the public domain. Uh, a, a young Taiwanese American entrepreneur uh, moved to India some time ago and set up a company called Embrace Innovations, uh, which looked at the problem of of premature babies dying because they were not being kept warm enough because incubators are much too expensive in much of the emerging world. So rather than a multi-thousand dollar solution, she and her team came up with, with something that costs 1% of what you know, a traditional medical device that addresses this issue would cost. And if you look at it, it seems like, like uh, a baby blanket of sorts. But the initial look is, is deceiving because embedded inside this sealed, seamless, blanket kind of device is, is a pouch where you can insert this, this pad, which is comprised of a, you know, it's a piece of plastic with, with a, a wax that melts at, at human body temperature. So you take that pad and you, you heat it up, you know, you can heat it up in water or any other method. And so it retains the, the, the latent heat and you insert it back into, into the device and then you wrap this around the baby and it maintains the baby's temperature for about six hours, I understand. Uh, and this costs, like I said, I, I think it's less than $100. And I think they've been looking at getting it distributed through funding from nonprofits and foundations. But the idea, again, was to look at the core problem, how to keep babies warm and how to how to improve their uh, you know their uh, ability to survive if they were born prematurely uh, the radical redesign no no not looking at mechanical devices not looking at electrical heating all of which can be a problem in a little village in, in remote africa or india you know they found a solution that uh, that can work uh, that doesn't require much maintenance and doesn't require much training 
So I, I, again, if you are interested in more uh, specifics about this, drop us an email, and I, I can send you a link to uh, public media stories about it. There are many, many other examples, uh, innovations that have happened in India relating to orthopedics uh, uh, with devices that cost a, a fraction of what is, uh, you know, what uh, what might be, have been available earlier. Some of these devices, you know, as a Western company, you might look and say, look, I really can't go there. And we totally understand that. We are not saying that you should step into the same product uh, development. But if you, are, if you can look at those ideas and be inspired by their thinking and then look at your core market of the 1 billion people and say, how do I serve the next 3 billion? Sometimes you can find that a tremendous increase in revenue can happen by looking at one of these types of uh, uh, radical redesign approaches. Let me give you an example from a completely different category, which is generally public information. So the consumer goods business used to sell shampoo in large bottles, which is the way it's sold in the US and most of the world. But in India today, 65% of the total volume of all shampoo sold is in what are called sachets. And these are little single use pouches that, that sell for a couple of pennies, uh, but today account for two-thirds of the revenue. And this, these, these have been very good, not only for small Indian companies, but for the like of giants such as Procter & Gamble and Unilever. And, and, and so I think within your own company, you need to look for you know, what could become the sachet of your, of your particular market segment or your particular category. And this is one of the most exciting areas for medical device companies to be looking at uh, you know, when you think about the Indian or the emerging country market. So let's call it a day at this point. Uh, you have uh, the choice of receiving a couple of our research reports as uh, shown here on this slide. And uh, for any of the other things that I referred to, uh, drop us an email at usa at amrit.com and within a few days we'll get back to you. Uh, it's over to you, Supriya. Great. Thank you so much, Gunjan, and thank you, everyone, for attending the webinar today, Medical Device Opportunities in India. We hope it was informative for you. If you have any additional questions, please do email us at usa at amrit.com. Please make sure as you exit the webinar that you complete a brief survey. Um, we appreciate your feedback. If you have any friends or colleagues who you think might benefit from a similar webinar, please do have them register on our website www.amrit.com, A-M-R-I-T-T.com, and we will notify them of any upcoming webinars. Thank you very much for attending today, and have a nice day. Goodbye.